Hello, everybody. Welcome to LARP Chat Live. I am Tara. I am the senior editor of the Geek Initiative, and I'm joined by my fantastic co-host, Max Energy. And we are going to talk about Dreamation, which is a gaming convention that happens this time of year every year in North Jersey. And we both attended this convention over the weekend. Max did a lot of tabletop gaming, and I LARPed the entire weekend. I played like six different characters. It was awesome. And uh, Max and I also did LARP one game together, so we can talk about that shared experience as well. So I already see a lot of awesome questions popping up here, uh, but I want to give you guys a rundown of the different uh, LARPs I went to. And I'm going to just keep it really fast so you guys can ask me questions about those particular uh, games. The first one I went to was a Game of Thrones LARP. It was awesome. Uh, all the LARPs I went to were awesome. Um, it was most, it was more familiar to those of us who do buffer combat style. There was no buffer combat, but it was more in that style, more in that play style. The second game I went to was In Residency. I feel like I'm forgetting one. I, I am, but I'll come back to it. Um, in Residency, which is about artists who are in residence at an artist colony, and it was uh, created by Lizzie Stark, and it was based on her actual experiences. So it was basically about um, creating art and having a lot of sexual tension, which I was, like, nervous about playing because I was like, how do you represent that in game? But I will tell you when we talk more about that. I played Oblivion, uh, which is a post apoc superhero game, and I love playing political stuff, and uh, this particular uh, module was all about that. So I was, I was there playing a reporter, and then I played Fagelin as well. That was super awesome uh, for fantasy combat. They had a really cool setup, and we'll talk more about that. And then I played uh, Feminism. It was a whole sampler. There was a whole sampler available, and I was able to play two games from that which is pretty cool. And I'm forgetting the name of the other one, but I'm going to find it and then we'll talk about it. But let's go ahead and talk about our first question here. Dreamation LARPing, fun or fail? Max, you went to, uh, to one LARP with me, actually. We went to Faylen together. What did you think, fun or fail? Uh, I mean, honestly, uh, Faylen did a good job, uh, I think, overall. I think that a majority of their players uh, had experience with LARPing. Uh, mm -hmm. But for some people, it was their first. They were walking on. And uh, everybody who it was their first time walking on, they walked out with a smile. But I feel that some of us, uh, well, myself, I'll just throw it out there. I was trying to be anonymous, but you introduced it by name. Uh, I think that they ran a poor encounter mm -hmm. uh, as far as the execution and logistics um we were sharing a space uh next to a table topping area and the uh Fagelin got a bunch of players in uh they were all super pumped they all needed to get their characters and they were queuing up at where the table was set up so it was gradually overflowing and then it started to envelop this other room where people were going to try to play tabletop and everybody was talking about their costume and how much fun they were going to have and then everybody would start talking over other people and it got really really loud and people were asked to be quiet a couple times and uh it, it felt a little disruptive to our neighbors which is you know as larpers we should always be friendly of our neighbors we don't want any bad blood but uh it didn't start on time uh and it started like uh, like a half hour late until we finally got in and the combat that I saw was very simple. I don't feel like it truly showcased uh, the nature of uh, Boffer LARP, like what, what it can be. Uh, people just had padded sticks. And some uh, undead came out of the water and just walked into PCs and were immediately cut down. Like, it was no actual Boffer combat. They just walked up, got hit a bunch of times, and fell down. Uh, and then one guy who was experienced came out wearing a special suit and attacked by himself and uh, tried to engage uh, 45 people uh, with one guy. He used complicated skill effects that affect the area of effect that half the people there had no idea what it did. Uh, some of them ignored it because they didn't understand. Everybody else had defenses because the combat in the first part of the section wasn't actually challenging at all. And uh, then that person died. 
the so, ball uh lend it make it hard like that was the combat the ballrooms make it hard to role play with people uh due to the nature of the acoustics and the tables that they had set up in the central play area which was an inn were those large round tables that you'd eat at a wedding that would comfortably fit like 10 people they were huge so i couldn't talk to anybody across the table because they were so far away so i was limited to only engaging people to my left or to my right or like crowding a bunch of chairs like around people it was it was it found it really hard to meet people and, con and conversate without a, a like a forced approach uh some of the npcs uh were not very engaging some of them like one person was kind of going around being extroverted uh but their costuming was great uh they had warmth and they had hospitality and uh, I think that those are all very important things and people enjoyed those things. Uh, and I'm sure the story got better, but after two hours I left, uh, I, I offered, I, before I left, I said, hey, it looks like you got a big turnout. Like, do you want an extra hand? You know, because I, I know the guy, I want him to be successful. And they were like, no, we're, we're good. We got it all under control. So I said, oh, okay. And then I waited another hour and uh, I started to fall asleep and I left. Yeah, my experience with uh, that game, I didn't think it was really like a fail. Um, I had a lot of good role playing there, but I completely lost my voice. And uh, I mean, I play a bard at a lot of these things, um, including at Faeglen. So I definitely am talking, chanting, or singing the entire time. Uh, so part of it's that. But um, the acoustics of the ballroom, um, as you mentioned, I think made it really difficult to uh to be heard and to hear other people and even when i was singing pretty loudly um it was just you know it was just rough it was it was just a tough room and i meant to sing a lot i had a lot prepared but i only sang one thing because and it was like i was singing as loudly as i could to three people who were crouched and listening in like you know leaning towards me because it was that loud in there and that's mm -hmm. i don't think that's a fault of you know, anybody running the game, but if you know what those rooms are like, you just have to plan for it. Or, uh, they, or also have a, they also have a called combat system. Mm -hmm. So uh, the escalation of noise it was even louder, you know, because everybody is going to be saying three, two, four, five, echo, 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 echo. It, it just, it was hard for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is, that, you know, can definitely add to the volume. I got to do a little bit of combat. My character isn't a combatant at Faglen and I played my regular character, but I did get in there and got a couple hits in and um, was actually even showing some of the people who hadn't LARPed before, or hadn't LARPed in a combat system before, how to do that. And that was really cool that they kind of found our crew because uh, that's what we do, you know? Um, I definitely started in <laughs> in a buffer combat LARP, so that's kind of a comfy scene for me. And, and we've both play played a lot of those. Uh, Max is an excellent uh, fighter, and we've also played Faglen before, so we were slightly familiar with the system, and um, and that was fun. So yeah, that was great. I really enjoyed role playing there. I actually thought it was going to be more combat than it was. Uh, I was a little disappointed that I didn't get to be involved in more combat and do my my backpack healing thing, um, but I had fun. Uh, There's a lot of interesting role play. I have to say, one of the storylines involved my character. And uh, I liked how they did it. Um, and it definitely hit, you know, one of the, uh, the points of my, char like, of my character that, um, that everybody learns about if they don't already know. So she healed somebody who seemed to be sick because she's a healer bard. And he was, like, looking like he was going to puke sick. So she heals him, and then he turns into a werewolf. And she was like, whoops that was bad and then so she runs back and finds the crew and she's like i healed this guy and now he's a werewolf can we go kill him that makes sense yeah it makes sense <laughs> totally but uh well i think they were trying to i think they were actually just trying to like involve me in you know the the plot and that was kind of a cool way to do it and so then it was clarified to me that my character felt was infected and felt compelled to help the werewolf so i started attacking anyone that was attacking the werewolf and obviously the other PCs dropped my character and one of them actually delivered a killing blow. And if you're new to LARPing, that, that's like slicing the throat, you know. And uh, her protector just strolls up, I guess, and is like, what's wrong? Someone heal her. Someone tries to heal me. It doesn't work because I received a killing blow. 
And so by the time my character wakes up, she just sees him killing someone else. And I'm like, this is a freaking bloodbath. Uh, but it was pretty cool to kind of to be involved that way and to give us something to do. Uh, that was neat. But, you know, just like any uh, regular fantasy buffer combat LARP, it had some downtime. Uh, it had some good roleplay opportunities. It had some combat opportunities. But I wish there had been a little more. One thing I absolutely loved that Fangland did was their setting. They did a pirate setting. And uh, their game isn't normally a, about pirates, but they do different themes each month within the within the realm of medieval fantasy uh, game. And they've done like a fairy tale game that I went to that I thought was really cool. And this particular mod was pirates, and I thought that was really neat because I just made my character a little bit more piratey looking than usual and kind of rolled in. So it gave the regular players the opportunity to do something a little different, whether they wanted to play their regular character or something new um and it was an accessible theme i think to new larpers because like pirate costuming is kind of on the easy end to do that said Agreed. the the level of costuming there i think was not only higher than what you normally see at the events but just in general really good like people brought out their best for for this particular mod and that was awesome so everyone looked really good at at Fagland. um and yeah i thought it was fun um, I thought I had a great experience at all of the LARPs I went to. I did leave Faglen and Oblivion early. It wasn't that I was like totally bored or anything. It was like I was exhausted. And if I wasn't constantly entertained, which is, you know, partially your fault if you don't feel entertained, uh, I just was tired. I didn't want to be a drag. I wanted to be healthy and, and um, you know, be able to get up and, and drive home the next day, basically. So that's why I rolled out a little bit early. Uh, but overall, like for the time that I was there, I had fun. One thing that both Oblivion uh, in residency and Fagland did was they had drink. So you were hydrating yourself. Um, and some of those games also had food, which I am very grateful for because I, I love the whole convention and the format and the layout. I don't think an hour between sessions is enough to get food um, unless you plan super well and bring it so Faglen, for example i had an elaborate costume which took me some time to to you know get dressed in and i also like i'd wanted to shower but i ended up waiting so um yeah it was just a little rough and then i started getting mad when we were like waiting in line and it was so loud and i'm like oh, i totally had time to eat and didn't and Max was like putting up with my complete bitchiness because I hadn't eaten. We went onto a store to like the little convenience store, and I was like, "Hey, I'll buy this like candy." And they were like, "Minimum ten dollars for credit cards." And I was like, "What?" I was ready to flip the table. Uh, so I was just like eating Reese's pieces, and I was like, "This is not what I want to do." Because last year at Dreamation, I drank a whole bunch of alcohol and I ate a whole bunch of sugar, and I was ridiculously sick when I got home. And I did not want that to happen again. So I was trying to avoid that. And yeah, and I just like ate candy because that's all I could get my hands on. And uh, so next year, I think I'll definitely prepare better for food. This year, I was like, I did a better job than I did last year. But it's just not enough time if you're getting dressed up for for a LARP that requires like an elaborate costume. So that's that's probably the thing I didn't like about it. I think it did color my experience a little bit more negatively just because I was cranky and didn't eat and we were waiting there in line. So, um, yeah. So that, for me, that was, like, the only, like, real fail part about the whole weekend. Uh, but, Dan, while we're talking about fun and fail, you did a lot of tabletop gaming at the convention. Uh, tell me about that. Fun or fail? Uh, again, I, I guess I can't be political, but... Uh uh f it uh i played uh like seven games the weekend and the uh, some of the modules that they ran i'm familiar with but uh like some of the i was lucky that the group i was traveling with we pretty much could practically fill a table i would say that like at least one table had somebody that was extremely obnoxious at it like extremely obnoxious and if you're at a larp you can like kind of walk away from those people uh but for the adventure league gaming tables the D D five edition like 
it was it, and like it was just like extremely obnoxious person at every table and uh the first two encounters i went on were ran by a guy and uh he had a lot of experience i could tell of uh, people were speaking of him but uh he kind of seemed like he phoned it in when he ran it like uh like his heart wasn't it and i, I guess i don't need an oscar awarded uh you know uh presentation but uh like he was just he wasn't i don't know he was just bad he was just not good like uh he didn't do any voices for the characters he didn't really leave room for role playing from the players uh there was no sense of rising action or if like we were off the rails he didn't like gradually get us back on for these encounters the way they ran and uh i walked away like drained from those encounters and uh then I had the pleasure of playing with uh, a gentleman who I played with like last year or maybe two years ago. And I remember, and he was amazing, uh, top notch, high energy, uh, and uh, very fluent in uh, the rules and he knows the stuff. And uh, he modified some of the encounters to make them crisp and flow seamlessly one scene to the next. And they were memorable encounters. They were great. They were amazing. Uh, he was a really good role player, and uh, everyone else in the table, kind of between him, myself, and one other person at our table, it kind of we resonated off each other, and we, everybody kind of got involved in the scene. And I'll remember that encounter forever. You know, it, it really brought it alive for me. Uh, and then uh, I had the pleasure of playing with another gentleman, uh, and he remembered me from like a year or so ago, me and a couple of my friends, which made me feel really good. You know, because some of these people you only see once a year, maybe twice a year. And it was nice that, you know, we made an impression and he was excited that we were there and we were able to work it out and play with them. And we had a really good time. Uh, they didn't have any new material, which I thought was weird. Sometimes some conventions can get like special adventures or encounters or things of that nature. And they weren't advertising anything new or special and uh, which had me confused. I was like, you know, we get all these people here. All these tables filled why aren't you know why aren't they getting something extra uh but my recommendation is to pre-reg uh encounters electronically so that you have seated tables and if a sign up sheet does get filled uh still right on the bottom underneath the table uh and they just kind of get everyone together and they kind of ballpark who wants the one rut encounter and the lists are kind of like a guideline it's not a hard and fast rule and then they kind of break up tables based on everybody forming together. So uh, if you ever go to Dreamation, you're trying to play tabletop, at least for the Adventure League game, uh, Adventure League stuff for D and D Fifth Edition. If a table's filled up, still sign up and just show up. Yeah, I would uh, also say with uh, I lucked out with the LARPs. I was able to get into everything I wanted to, but part of that was oh my gosh, no, I'm not gonna sing right now. Maybe later. Um, part of that was. I got in and my friends were like, play this with me, play that with me. And my friend Isabel, who is often uh, on here, helped me out by like signing me up for some stuff and writing down my badge number. I was way too last minute about it. I really took a risk uh, uh, of, you know, missing some of the LARPs I wanted to do by doing that. And when I was at Metatopia, um, it was kind of the same deal, you know, like, I just I missed stuff because I didn't sign up for it in advance. So next time, I swear I'm gonna sign up in advance and and get to it. But I'm really lucky that I was able to get into everything I did. So Lee is asking us, feeling a tad nostalgic. How does the event compare to previous years? Now I've only been to one generation before, and that was last year. I actually found out about it from Max. Uh, I've also been to Metatopia, which is also a double exposure event, and more that's more about like game testing. Um, I think Dreamation is more my style because uh, I'm mainly a LARPer, and there are a lot more LARPs there. Although Metatopia has them, I have not been to a DexCon yet, but would like to go. And I had more fun this year because I knew what to expect, uh, and because like I made some more plans around my group and also the friends that I had that were going and. Last year, I was, like, bummed because I didn't know a lot of people and stuff like that. And this year, it was, like, even when I walked into a LARP by myself, I already knew people in there from last year and from Facebook. So, uh, yeah. 
so that was kind of cool um oh gosh no i'm not singing right now stop uh <laughs> but i thought i had more fun this year because uh of the other people there that i knew people um and planned a little bit better but still kept things loose enough that i could you know make changes if i wanted to which i've also as a convention attendee and going to some of these things as press i've learned you just have to do like you need to pick out one or two things that you cannot miss and that you will plan your weekend around but other than that you need to kind of realize like hey you know i might not make it to everything so i did miss warbirds which um was disappointing because i wanted to go but there were just too many conflicts and that was my one regret my one uh, unrequited love of the weekend but um yeah other than that i actually had more fun this year because i knew what to expect having gone last year how about you max uh i feel that every time i arrive at the con they are using the space a little bit differently which i like uh they try to be a little bit more innovative they had a little bit more mainstream uh, board, like tabletop board games in the lobby of the hotel, if you can kind of close your eyes and imagine it, like, underneath like the double sun light sculpture chandelier they had when you first walk in the sliding doors. So like to the left, uh, they had a bunch of tables set up for people playing all kinds of card games and board games. And then to the right, they had like social deduction games which uh, were very accessible for people to kind of sit down and just start playing. And then, uh, then you had the bar area, of course. And uh, and then behind them, there was like, a, they ran like LARPs there. I think Dystopia Rising ran there primarily. Uh, but then they would put like tabletop, they put the tabletop games right next to the live action role playing games that are so, very loud. So I was like, that's not proper planning. That's sucks. You know, they shouldn't have done that. That's really bad. Uh, but I think they just had so many tabletop games. I guess that's uh, they might be getting too big for the hotel, and I guess that's a problem to have. But uh, I feel that the convention organizers as a whole are on point. Check-in is seamless, uh, very, very easy. They allow you to sign up for events ahead of time when you pre-register, and then they'll print out like a schedule for you. Uh, my only concern was that they didn't post the schedule until like less than a week before the actual event and the grid or the schedule with the events, it's always late. They always say, oh, it'll be this day. And then it gets pushed back three days. Everyone's always like, it gets back 48 hours. And then finally, when it gets up, it's usually like 48 hours before the event, like yeah. every year. Uh, but it is what it is. Um, the... The tabletop, like this year and the live action role playing events, I feel that uh, the ones that I saw didn't really set the bar anymore. But my friend Liam that I talked to said that one of the encounters had a bunch of industrial fans that they used to set up like an indoor hurricane. So there is still like creativity and innovation and people really embracing the hotel medium. Uh, one uh, LARP tried to have players do scavenger hunt stuff, but like one of the items they were looking for was a bomb. And it wasn't in, like, an enclosed play area. It was, like, where, like, average Joe Muggle was sitting, like, waiting for a cab or for food or in the lobby. So, like, it could have made having that conversation, like, oh, do you do you see the bomb? <laughs> you know, that could have been a little yeah. awkward. It's good uh, that they notified security at a time, but I think it still could have, like, it could have really become exaggerated because, you know, hotel patrons don't know that, you know, um... So yeah. I, I, I was mean, playing that game. A, and... You could have found like a different MacGuffin, like yeah. the trans transmitter box that's dig transmitting like a digital computer virus that will cause an explosion. I but was playing. Like, I was playing that game, and we the, the players, players, we the players made the decision to call them bricks. Uh, the mm -hmm. fizz reps didn't look like bombs, which is also helpful. But we were calling them bricks and then describing them to people as, "Hey, I'm looking for a clear plastic box so that it." sound a little bit less suspicious and um you know most of the people there were with the conventions so they at least knew what larping was but some people weren't you know and uh it it did destroy the immersion a little bit um it was super cool that that game uh, actually took us up to a hotel room as part of the as part of the scenario like it was taking place in a hotel since it was a modern setting so that was really cool it involved the whole hotel and like a scavenger hunt thing and 
I'm not really like embarrassed as a LARPer. Like I'll go out wherever in costume, unless my friends shave me, which has happened before. <laughs> Max <laughs> and Rick and Brian. Anyway, um, <laughs> Rick's over there wondering what he did. Um, <laughs> but anyway, you know, I I uh, I'm not usually the kind of person that's like too embarrassed to go out in costuming, and that was like a modern setting anyway. So I was just wearing a fancy dress. Um, and it did kind of like break the immersion a little bit because I had to think like, nope, I can't call it a bomb. That's for sure. Uh, but I think like the players, fortunately, and the staff handled it well once we realized it was an absolutely horrible idea to, to do. Um, and that was fortunate, but it could have gone wrong. Yeah, that could have gone wrong. So yeah, bombs that were, we called them bricks. So uh, Max wants to know if the Game of Thrones LARP was as graphic as HBO. That is a great question. Uh, yes and no. Um, the people who ran the game were uh, very, very clear about the fact that it had adult themes. It has things that may make you uncomfortable. And at any time, you can exit the play area, request a clarification. For example, if I'm like, hey, you know, I want to do something to your character against their will, whether it's like physical violence, rape, whatever, uh, the players could clarify that. I didn't actually see a lot of that happen in the game. I don't think that anything like that did, but uh, there was definitely some blood, some like graphic violence, um, but it wasn't depicted. It was like clarified that there was blood on the ground. They weren't obviously going to ru ruin the hotel uh, floor with fake blood. So um, yeah, like, you know, it, it, it was there, but it was made very clear, and there was always a staff member present for uh, to talk to for clarific rules clarifications, and also, you know, if you felt uncomfortable or whatever, there was, they were very clear about the fact that you didn't have to, like, stay in a scene or entertain anything that made you uncomfortable, so that was cool. There was uh, a little kid there that was a little weird, um, you know, what? especially... Yeah, there was a kid there, and it was, like, a little strange because it was... Like, how old? Like, like 14? Or, like, no, no, no. Or like... like, two? You know, like, no, it wasn't, it wasn't Joffrey. Fuck. Um, and it was weird because, like, his parents didn't want him exposed to, uh, to vulgar language. Um, but I was playing a, I was playing a chieftain, and, uh, she was not sanitized you know like i was probably one of the more aggressive characters there i was like throwing people against the wall and threatening them and telling them i was gonna like rip their effing guts out if they hurt my friends stuff like that and you know like i didn't have any problems because i didn't encounter the child like during the game really but it just kind of like you know was in the back of my mind kind of like wondering like what's the deal with this um but what do you yeah. guys in the chat room think? Do you think the kid should have came, or do you think that the the coordinator should have asked them to leave? Just type in a one if they should have stayed, or two if they should have gone, or been asked to leave. What do you guys think? Two gone. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> the, yeah, the consensus thinks that maybe it wasn't. A, what the hell, Matt? Three. The consensus seems to think it was not a. Uh, an appropriate venue for the the child um you know he slept most of the time that's fine uh i didn't really feel comfortable it's one of those things like um kind of like you know should pregnant women larp it's like you can't really tell them not to but on the other hand if i don't feel comfortable hitting you when you're eight months pregnant like i shouldn't have to be in combat against you like no one should force me to do that uh it's a very it's an, touchy subject yeah, it's really like, and I definitely see both sides of it. I I really do. Um, and you know, I, I kind of feel similarly know. about this. I don't know if I could live with the guilt if like I attack somebody at night from behind and like caused a miscarriage. I don't know yeah. if I could ever live with that I guilt. Would be like I'm done larping forever, basically. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's it's really tough. Uh. That's and I I think this was kind of like a similar thing. Uh, not as, you know, to like a lesser degree, I think, because you're not, there was no buff or combat involved. You're not going to injure the child. But, you know, I'm definitely walking around being like, I'm going to murder your face. You know, while there's this little child there. And hopefully he understood that I was totally just kidding and I wasn't actually going to murder anybody's face. So, 
Does what happens at the con truly stay at the con? Well, I'll, I'm going to talk about one of the games I played, which I wasn't really sure how it was going to go or if I was even really going to be able to play the game um, because I, I married and, <laughs> like, I, you know, I respect my husband and I respect that relationship and I'm not really interested in getting together with anybody else. But I did play the game that I talked about called In Residency. Which is and, the one I should have went to, not Fagelin. Which is the one you should have gone to. Um, and I took a friend who had actually never been to a freeform LARP to In Residency, and he loved it, which I was hoping for, but still sort of surprised at, because uh, it was almost all role play. There wasn't really any like combat or anything like that. So a hardcore buffer LARPer, you might think, wouldn't like it. But there was a lot of great role play, and the way it worked. First of all, Lizzie gave a very detailed uh, overview. It was detailed but simple. It was easy to understand. Overview of how the game would work, what kind of characters you play. And then when it came to all that stuff, she was like, if your characters need to have a private moment or anything, you simply go to the sculpture garden, which was in the next room over. And uh, that's where they have a private moment. And that's actually all she said. And uh, my character um, was not one of the first to leave and go have a private moment. Um, but she did at one point go out there and have a private conversation that turned into a moment. And the way we handled it was exactly as I would have handled it in uh, my regular Boffer LARP, should that ever happen for my character, which was to clarify, like, what do you think is going to happen? Like, the ca our characters had already talked about it, and they were like, let's do it. And then we just clarified, like, they'd do it. And then we, like, stood there for a minute. It wasn't awkward. Um, and then we it just sounds like, back in. super awkward. <laughs> it actually, no, it, totally, <laughs> it really wasn't. It was not awkward at all. Only but, a um... minute. <laughs> like, I think it would be more awkward <laughs> take more than a minute. to proposition a female to have fake role play sex than to actually proposition them to have a drink and to see what happens. So, like, well, it's, like it's weirder to, to do the fake than the real. Okay, to go into the situation, um, our characters had all formed different relationships uh, as part of the character creation process. So you'd walk across the room and the person you were next to would be your enemy or your friend or your best friend or your crush. Okay, and bitch. right. And for <laughs> for my character, this was actually her best friend. So they were talking a lot about you know the other characters and what they thought and. Um, and like our whole thing about it's it's really funny. I had to tell my friend Kristen this because I uh, I, <laughs> I write with her a lot um, in the same genre. But we had decided that at this high art colony, that um, our dirty little secret was that we met because we write Avengers fan fiction, and um, <laughs> that was how our characters knew each other. So they had this like secret that they did. Uh, but they were they were like writers, you know, and that's why they were at this colony. And my character was a playwright. And anyway, so the part of the the module involves like you know everyone goes out and they can drink if they want to, and they just have water, which is great because we stayed hydrated. Um, I loved that being incorporated into it because it was like self care being incorporated into the fact that your character was being completely self destructive. It was wonderful. Uh, and so I was drinking a lot of water. And, uh, you know, we go out and have the private conversation, and the way the conversation was, they were like, okay. I was like, I gotta tell you something. And then his character was like, okay. Um, yes, I may actually write Avengers fan fiction. Anyway. And um, and then uh, basically we're like, okay, count of three. We're gonna say it. One, two, three. And we- Velociraptor. Like, it was kind of like that. Only not Velociraptor. And then- um, so it wasn't awkward because our characters had kind of asked each other at the same time. But for the characters, it was awkward later because they completely ruined their friendship by getting together. And it sucked. Like, her best friend, you know, it was, like, it was heartbreaking. Um, but, yeah. So, like, I, it actually wasn't awkward. I was afraid it was going to be... Um, I have other friends that have, like, RP'd in, like, you know, a LARP setting where they like went into a tent and made noises. Other people just clarified it. They just talked about it out of game between games, like whatever. Um, but it actually wasn't as awkward as I'd feared. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, how it went. So that was my only like 
scary moment about that kind of thing. And I was, I just went into that LARP being like, oh, if I feel uncomfortable, I'm going to walk away. And I'd played uh, Lizzie's games before. So I knew that I definitely could talk to her at any time or that um, this type of LARP uses the cut and break. So if you want to end the scene in a freeform LARP, you can say cut, and that means the scene just stops and you are free to walk away. Or if it's getting kind of uncomfortable, like if you're talking about um, something that's, you know, making me uncomfortable, I can say break. And that just means like, you know, I'm still okay with the conversation, but like, this is a sensitive subject for me. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the rules in place, but I didn't have to use them. It was completely fine. I was really into the game. And I actually like, I, and I know I wasn't the only person that felt this way, but I was drinking the water to represent drinking alcohol in the game. And even after the game ended, even after I was all the way up in a hotel room, I still felt drunk, even though like I was just hydrated. You know, it was really weird. Like just role playing being drunk for so long. I still felt drunk. It was, that was strange, but good, I guess. But I don't know. What do you think, Max? Does what happens at the con truly stay at the con? Uh, yes, it does. Period. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I knew you were going to say I, that. It does. And it doesn't. Uh, I feel that the events that we carry with us uh, at, from that weekend, uh, we will remember until next year or six months because this uh, con runs every six months. And, uh, but it, they are kind of like, its own little world like there are people that i see and play with that i only ever see there and it's weird you know like that like i don't ever see them in any other games even when i play games up in north jersey i don't see them there uh and i wonder uh where are they going uh why aren't they larping or tabletopping outside of just dreamation when mystic realms was running events there they we we got i think two players after like five six years of running events twice a year and uh we just the juice wasn't worth the squeeze uh so we stopped but uh i, I feel like that yeah even to a negative extent what happens to con stays the con i feel like it's not a good way to attract new players hmm. yeah it's it's what's awkward actually is ha like role-playing close relationships with people and i'm not just talking about like the the guy who played my character's best friend it actually did not feel awkward at all with him um but i did see other people from the same larp and mm -hmm. i was thinking that i was gonna like shout out to them in the hallway or whatever but we passed each other and there was just like an awkward glance and i'm like why is there just an awkward glance like you know our characters drink together <laughs> like that yeah. was a little weird um that actually really was awkward and it's not like other cons like new york comic-con just about everyone has business cards even if you just have like your own blog or even if you're just um like a big fan you know and um basically like it, it's not like that here and i wasn't there as press this time which is different than what i usually do so i wasn't going around handing out business cards and stuff like that but i did feel like i wanted to be like i love role playing with you uh, can we connect or like, Hey, where do you live? You know, maybe you could come to my, the games that I play because you're a really good role player. Like I encountered so many amazing role players at this convention. It was ridiculous. It was a very high level of RP. I felt like I was maybe like just below or on par with most of the role players. And that when you click with somebody, it's just like the scene just keeps going. It's amazing. And I, I don't know who those people are. I think some of them I'm like, friends with on Facebook some of them I'm not um you know and I'm like oh man how do I know who played that person and I know from like the debriefing and stuff like that that some of them were first-time LARPers so there's probably not people that I can find easily either uh and that's another thing I want to add about what happens at the con um and what happens in uh specifically like free form LARP modules some of them are really emotionally intense and there is a debriefing process where you talk about how you felt. A lot of people will like take their character name tag off and like, or the character sheet and they'll rip it up to represent like separating yourself from the character before you walk away. Um, and 
Max, you're giving me a weird look, but I feel like That's it's so kind of, weird. That's so weird. It's important though, because like you need to kind of say goodbye to the character. And then on Monday, I went back to work, and I was like, man, it's a little. In a way, it's a little more intense than, um, like this last month at Seventh Kingdom when I had a really intense moment as my character and was like, I wonder if I'm gonna have like all this bleed when I go back to work because so many awesome things happen, and I'm still like, oh my god, I got to heal King Baylor. It was not at all like that. It was like. I lived, like, six different lifetimes over the weekend is how it felt. I felt like I was, like, quantum leaping, you know, through the whole weekend, and then I just had to, like, go to work. So those debriefings are really important because they let you step away from your character, and some people play mean characters. Like, in the Game of Thrones LARP, some of the characters do some very nasty things. My character was particularly aggressive, like, even more so than the main LARP character I play, and I think that was important for me to step away from that and be like, okay, ripping up the character name. I'm done with this character now. I'm taking off the circlet. You know, I'm not her anymore. Um, I think uh, it's important. And Amy's saying um, that she often wonders about bleed. And for those who don't know, bleed is when you experience some type of reaction or emotion, and then it carries over into uh, your real life after the game ends. And um, it can also go the other way. Like, you know, I'm depressed because something happened in real life, and then my character, you know, can't be happy because of the same reason. Uh, obviously, that can happen too. But um, I mean, one moment that I've had with Bleed is a lot of people hated my character. They got very upset at my character at my main game. And then I noticed people started treating me differently outside of the game. And that's horrible because it's like your social support, you know, your group of friends just like drops you. And it's like, all because you think my character did something shitty. And like, she didn't even really do anything shitty. It was just someone else was setting it up that way. And uh, that was really hurtful. And I don't think uh, all of it was even intentional on the part of the people that were doing it. I don't even think they like thought, I'm not gonna talk to Tara because her character was an asshole um, or because I was led to believe that her character's an asshole. I think it was just like this whole thing. Like some people stopped interacting with me and then a whole bunch did. And that lasted for a couple of months, and um, it gave me the opportunity to get closer to some other people, but it definitely made me think. So, in that sense, what happens at the game can uh, be something that you carry with you, even if you don't want to. So, let's move on to uh, another question here. Chris asks, regarding LARP space at Double Exposure, which space is your favorite for Bach for style LARPs? That's a really good question because we mentioned that the ba the ballrooms were really loud and uh, both Oblivion and Faglen uh, were in the ballrooms and they did have Bach for combat and they did both get loud, especially Faglen. Um, so I would not recommend the ballrooms even for like RP because a lot of Oblivion happened, uh, when it first happened, it was just RP and it was actually supposed to take place in a hotel in a fancy ballroom. But uh, the noise level, like, even then, it was bothering people. So I would not recommend it for buffer games. Uh, but I don't really know where else would be good. Max, what do you think? I think that depending on the style of encounter that you're running and how many people you plan to host, that definitely plays a factor. If you think there isn't going to be more than 45 people in your room, that the room next to the bar is leaps and bounds better than any other location at the hotel. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but Oblivion ran that last year. Higher, it's too many people in one room. Uh, when we ran it there, uh, it was good real estate and that people coming in and out of the hotel saw it. We were near the elevators. We were near the bar, which was awesome. Yeah. And uh, it was a great location and good space. And then there's a separate door to get inside from the back, which is a single door so that your NPCs and st your props and stuff are back there. And then there's a back, like like a back room that's connected. Uh, like when you walk into the double doors by the bar, back into the right, there's like a whole nother room where you can keep all your NPC stuff or use it as space, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's long, it's like a, a nice long rectangle. And as long as you're smart about it, I mean, it's definitely the best space. Uh, the ballrooms, yeah. I feel can be good if your combat doesn't involve calling numbers. 
uh, and if you leave the divide up, the partition, and then have other things that act as partitions or like noise dampeners, uh, and as long as you don't have loud music playing, it could work. The learning centers, like the small conference rooms, I think it'd be cool for like a modern setting, uh, but it would be it would be hard to run a buffer style game in all those rooms with all those doors opening and closing. Yeah, the learning center. So Game of Thrones was in the learning center, uh, and it was not actually a buffer LARP, although you could carry weapons to represent the weapons that you're carrying, which uh, my character carried a very large hammer. Um, and, you know, you had to use a lot of imagination. Like, they didn't decorate the whole thing like a medieval, you know, hall or a forest. Uh, however, there were there was one key scene in which I participated, and they did an amazing job with lighting, two tables, and some cloth to make it look like this big old tree. And I didn't even realize until I exited the scene that I was actually looking at a table and not, you know, some specially constructed prop. It was really, really awesome. Um, so I think Learning Center would be great for uh, if you don't need a lot of room. So no for Boffer. Um, and I agree with those other rooms, like Max was talking about, by the bar. Oblivion ran there last year. And... Um, they had a great mod this year, but last year's was just also really awesome. Very different scene, uh, very different setting, but they use that space so well. I'm not even really sure how big that space is. I feel like they kind of made that space like seem twice as large as, as it was. Like They really used the space well. Uh, but yeah, I agree. That was a pretty decent place for it. And they actually they had like walls and stuff up, like tarp walls or whatever up. And the noise level wasn't too loud. They let um, groups of like four or five in at a time so that they minimized how much noise there was and how many people would be in each encounter. And it was very challenging. It was a lot more challenging, I think, than this year's uh, Oblivion module only because they separated people into small groups for that. Uh, towards the end of this year's Oblivion module, we did separate into different groups to complete different objectives and that had the same feeling. So uh, yeah, they do that well. But that space definitely is awesome. And Jess asks, were all the LARPs one shot or were any of them teasers of a larger game? My impression is that the buffer LARPs uh, were either separate modules that relate to the larger game or kind of teasers for the large larger game. I don't really know whether or not they entirely fit into their uh, big setting, but they gave some awesome bonuses to uh, players, to existing and new players. Uh, and incentives for them to come back to the game. So I felt like those were part of a bigger thing just because they were campaign LARPs. But all of the freeform LARPs that I played, the exception of Game of Thrones, which I guess was sort of freeform, were um, were one shots. The Game of Thrones LARP runs exclusively at these double exposure conventions. And that was my favorite LARP that I played there. And even if I'm only going up to one of their events just to play Game of Thrones, I will go up to one of their events just to play Game of Thrones because the LARP was that good. And what I what we did, this event affects the next one. So um, that's really cool. I heard returning players say, oh my gosh, the setting is like this because of what we did last time. And that was really great to hear, especially as a new player thinking like, oh, I can actually change the outcome. So I will go um back up to the convention even if i'm like busy that weekend just to play game of thrones it was that amazing max what was your impression about uh the different games there and also as that applies to uh tabletop were they all like one shots or part of larger campaigns how does that work uh the we you and i played the same lark uh, that is definitely a teaser uh, the ones that I saw were normally one shots up there, or uh, except for the Boffer games. Okay. The tabletop games were all part of living campaigns. Uh, what happens is they have organizations that create content, and then they run that content at that convention, other conventions. And if you are a convention of significant size, sometimes you can get special encounters just for your area. Sometimes you'll get celebrity or guest judges or the people that wrote those modules that were selected uh, to be a part of that season. Uh, they will run their content there. And normally that person is the best person to run the encounter because they wrote it. Uh, but 
We got a sneak peek Sunday morning. We had the option. They ran one or two tables of the next season, uh, The Curse of Strahd, which is uh, a Ravenloft-style game. They're going back to Ravenloft. I had no interest in checking that out. I think that they need to create new worlds, not just keep using the same stuff. Uh, usually the people I find that are most excited to play Ravenloft are the people that I would never really ever want to play with. And granted, that's just anecdotal, but like the people that are like, oh my God, I love Ravenloft. I'm like, typically, I don't ever want you to sit at a table I play at. But uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how it went. Maybe the material is better this year. Who knows? Uh, it was always that. Uh, Sorry, guys. That, that, <laughs> well, text. Well, oh my God. They're like, <laughs> not too conscious. Uh, but but uh, I would say that. Uh, the role playing there was good, and the encounters there were good, and, um, and I'm excited to check out ConCon, Con, which is going to be some of those people there invited me to go up and run for them, and uh, I'm checking I'm checking it out. I might do it. They're going to have the uh, new material for season four for the tabletop, and they're also going to have uh, an epic from season one. Like like in season one, there was a cataclysmic event. I won't spoil anything for you. And then season two and three were like uh, reactions to that. But now they're going to run an epic where you can like go back and fix the event that happened in season one. Awesome. Uh, we're going to head to Amy's question. Here we go. Amy asks, how did the male gamers respond to the feminism LARPs? So I attended uh, two, technically two different feminist LARP events. One, which is the one that Amy's referring to here, is uh, hashtag feminism. And uh, the other, I actually just accidentally pasted that in here, was called Auto Autonomy. Um, and that is a, a flipped version of the real world where women run Congress and men fight for the right to make their own medical decisions. Um, and as the uh, woman who ran the game, I forget her name, she was great, uh, but as she uh, explained it, the, the men who are here participating in the game are probably not actually the ones that need to hear it, <laughs> uh, which is true. You know, uh, there are, you know, people who are aware or open-minded and, um, you know, I, they did seem to have insights about, you know, what they learned and what it was like to play, um, you know, people who had to basically fight to make their own medical decisions. Uh, that whole LARP was really interesting. Um, it started with an exercise in which the uh, people who identified as male and people who identified as female were separated. Uh, and those of us who identified as female were taught body language and posture and a way of standing and sitting and speaking even that is uh, completely um, more powerful. So no up speak where you're talking like this and making your statements like a question and asking to be validated, but instead down speak like this, where your opinion is an authority and that's just how it is. Uh, we were also taught to stand with our legs at least shoulder width apart, to take up more space when we sat, um, to kind of just take up space with our arms too when we were addressing people and even to do like the Wonder Woman pose with your hands on your hips. And the men were taught and had to be constantly reminded, even though they're very aware um, individuals, in my opinion, that they had to kind of shrink down like this a little bit and not make direct eye contact as possible. They were using a lot of the upspeak and uh, they actually had to like think about that as they went on. We all did. And uh, the women sat behind a table, a long table, and we were given food and drink. And um, Basically, we were playing members of Congress that were making decisions for the men and their bodies and whether or not we felt that they should have autonomy over their own bodies and could make their own medical decisions. And um, it went pretty well. Uh, but I have to say, like, there was a little bit of self-control involved because as you start playing, you're like, oh, my gosh, I want to say all the shit that I always get annoyed at, you know, that I always feel like. You know, like one of them said, uh, oh, my boss, um, she sent me here to give my testimony on this issue. And then we pretty much like disqualified that man's um, expertise when we found out that his boss was a woman. And therefore, like we just assumed she was more intelligent because that's how the setting ran. 
Uh, so, yes, there were male gamers. They did say they had a difficult time um, doing the more diminutive uh, body language and speech. And I uh, think they learned a lot that way and learned a lot about um, how when those actions are repeated, how it's like, re it's really hard not to just continue to assume, you know, that state. You know, it's, and I know the opposite way with my campaign LARP, I have to like consciously RP a leader and I have to like think about it when I do it because in real life, I'm not always allowed that chance. And so I think uh, for them, it was kind of like that, like they had to think about not talking over people sometimes, even though they were a very um, nice and socially aware group of people. So uh, that was for autonomy. For the hashtag feminism LARPs, um, I played two different games. And uh, in the one of them, it was called Shouting to the Stars, I think. And basically there were two groups, one group, a smaller group, we were all qualified scientists and we were trying to fix a problem on a spaceship that was about to launch. And one group was always talked over. Um, if they presented a good idea, the larger group would simply restate it and claim it as their own idea, stuff like that. And you could tell like one or two of them really kind of were affected by it at the end of the thing. So we did have a debriefing where we talked about that and it made them, you know, it made them think about how some women feel and and are talked over pretty constantly and uh yeah so i think it impacted them but i also agree with the woman who wrote autonomy and uh and her opinion being that the guys who are playing this are the guys who probably don't need to learn it they're guys who are already open to being aware and that's unfortunate but it helped me uh, both of those games definitely helped me learn a little bit more about myself and about what it's like to be on the other side and about what it's like to want to retain those privileges when you have them. That's certainly true. Uh, why would you want to give up your authority when you are entitled to it? Like, it doesn't make sense. So, uh, yeah, you know, they. I think, like, it definitely affected them, but I think it was something they expected. Thank you for that question, Amy. Okay, we'll move on to this one, which I am not an expert in because I did not avoid the con plague. <laughs> um, Max actually, uh, the question is, how can I avoid con plague at these things? And Max was actually one of the people in my group that seemed pretty aware of like, when are we eating? When are we sleeping? You know, uh, what time are we getting up in the morning? So for me, it helped to kind of be with a group where we were kind of taking care of each other. And, you know, when I said I was hungry, the people that I was, that I was with were always like doing what they could to make sure I ate, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, this whole like five to one rule or whatever that Matt was talking about uh, earlier, <laughs> uh, I, I slept for six plus hours. I had two plus meals. And I showered daily, but I still got the con plague. I failed. My uh, my advice is to plan ahead, uh, or you're going to uh, just squander the ritual. Uh, the schedule like is, you know, very structured. So if you show up a half hour late, you're effed. Not for just four hours, but for like four hours plus the break. So it's if you miss something. You have to wait five hours for something else for as far as tabletop or uh, live action is concerned. Board games and card games are a little bit more liberal. Uh, I, if my advice to anyone who's going is to pack breakfast, uh, yeah. especially if you're sharing a room with people and if everybody has like a morning ritual and they all want to go take a shower or whatever before they leave. So I brought tea and I brought like a couple apples and uh, just something real light. And then I would sit down at my table with a bagel and cream cheese or I would grab like, I'd grab something like that. But for like the first hour or two that I was up, I would uh, I would do that. Uh, if you could pick up bagels or, or I think instant oatmeal uh, it would be really good because most hotels have like a coffee. Uh, coffee machine so you can have hot water 
but I felt that going with a group larger than four people uh, is crazy and trying to do everything together as a crew. Because even at four people, it was rough because you're always only moving as fast as the slowest person in your group. And like, just when you think everything's good, you're like, one person's going to like jump in the shower. Like, oh, it's got to jump in the shower before we go out to eat. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, are you kidding me? You know what I mean? So uh, it's like, it's like having kids. You know what I mean? So uh, when you, when you're that big, that large. So uh, my recommendation is pack your own breakfast talk while you're waking up for breakfast decide where you're going to order from lunch and what you're going to want and then one person calls 20 minutes 30 minutes before the time slots over so that that place isn't bombarded with lunch orders all simultaneously and say you know we're going to want delivery for this time grab it at the hotel like the when you're leaving pick it up at the at the front desk and then eat in your room because every other thing's going to be crowded or people are going to come up and talk to you you really need nutrients. And if you're all playing different games, this is your time to spend with your group. You know what I mean? Uh, if you are so inclined and can get away with eating things that are microwaved, bring lunch you can microwave. Or a midnight snack you can microwave. But not everybody likes to do that. Some people like to eat a little bit fresher. And then dinner, your break is two hours. That's the time when you go out. You know, And that's the time when you kind of like chill a little bit but the places to eat around there they either are poor quality food like there's a diner that i will not go even if i'm starving to death or fast food or there's a really nice chinese place it's right across the street but it takes forever like they're just slow i'm not so going there it, again i'm, I'm yeah, over the chinese <laughs> we yeah, should have gone to the it's irish so pub it's, i agree with you uh, yeah, but again, we have to make like group decisions. I think the perfect way to go is with one other person, uh, but uh, or at least you know, just I don't know. I would recommend only really going with another person. But if you have to do, if you're going in a group, no more than four, or else you're you're making decisions by committee, and you waste thirty minutes of your hour yeah. or your two hour break deciding on what everybody wants to do. And assume that like all of your plans and expectations with a big group just aren't going to work out. Like it's just not going to happen. And as long as you go in with that expectation, because last year I had some expectations and I was like bummed when I left because I was like, I went with my friends that I usually LARP with and they didn't want to LARP with me. What the hell? And this year I was like, you know what? If they don't want to LARP, I can still go to all these things and know people there and feel comfortable there. Screw them. But yeah, they, ended up, year, they ended up being cool year, and coming to LARP with me. <laughs> this year, the shoe was on the other foot. It was. You, know, you, were, so, you were supposed to table time with us oh. and you didn't. <laughs> And uh, you decided to, you know, sleep. But it, it is what it is. I owe you a tabletop gaming session. Forget about it. As long as you walked <laughs> away having fun and, you know, the, the the check is on both columns and that we're square true. We're from even. last year and this year. <laughs> we're even. That's true. So, yeah, like, nothing, uh, you know, not all expectations will be met. And this year, though, actually, I can't say it was, like, majorly disappointed at any time except for that moment when i'm like when are we going into fagland and i was so hungry and it wasn't like it wasn't fagland's fault i was just pissed that i didn't have enough time to eat before i got there because it takes too long to costume i think i would do better with an hour and a half between sessions in the in the afternoon and evening than an hour just because like when do you eat dinner i don't know or or if you're heavy costume like you yeah. just gotta like bounce, like you yeah. can't hang out and talk That's, to the way. You just gotta commit to taking care of yourself. Like your needs are more important uh, than socializing with people you won't see for a year. Uh, David Ellis asked, "Was Greyhawk were born there?" Yes, they were there. I didn't have the pleasure of trying any of their encounters. I really wanted to, uh, but the they they weren't running anything that I had a time slot when I can play, so I missed them, and I'm hoping to see them soon. Yeah, I saw them all over the list, um, but didn't play. So, let's see. Chris Goley asked, do you believe that conventions are a good place to debut a LARP that is attempting to build themselves up to a weekend-style game? Uh, very short, no. I don't. I don't? Yeah, I agree. It's a risky investment. 
So it's good. It's a good place to like get your name out there to network to um, meet people. But I like if you have a crew of four people who are founding a new game, like a weekend game that happens once a month, for example, like the kind of games that we're used to playing, wear the t-shirt, introduce yourself, make really great relationships with the uh, owners of the other games that are there, make sure they know who you are, for, form those connections, build some trust. You're going to get more value out of that and knowing those game runners and those players and the LARP community than you are running a game. Uh, if you do run a game, one thing I was... I'm not sure if Oblivion and Fagla did this, and they might not have done this for me because they already know who I am, but um, they didn't have, like, a sign-up sheet with your, like, where you had to put your email and stuff on there. Uh, you know, a basic, I work in marketing, and a basic rule of marketing is you always want to capture their email address so that you can contact them later and invite them to try your product. And, uh, you know, like, I played six, seven LARP this weekend. Uh, and when I just listed them out, even though I'm doing this blab on LARPing a Dreamation, I forgot one of them the first time. So uh, it could very well be like, man, I played that really great LARP, and I don't remember what it was called, but it was about like yeah, it's pirates. Just poor marketing. Like they might not remember that it was Faglen, and and it would be really cool if Faglen reached out to them and were like, hey, come to you know come to my game because you know like you know, Tony's like that, he's super welcoming, he wants you to come to his game. And uh, that kind of list would enable him to do that. So I don't, I don't, they might have done that. Um, and I just wasn't on it because I'm already like, part of that Facebook group and I already know you guys. But um, yeah, like that's definitely uh, a big tip for, for anyone. And uh, handing out materials as well. Business cards are a pretty good investment. Um, I used to recommend Vistaprint for business cards, but Staples actually has a surprisingly affordable deal. And I actually got the Geek Initiative's business cards done there before we went to Metatopia as press. And um, I think it was only like $10 or 500 or something like that. Really, really good deal. Um, and that's like full color, glossy. So it's a really inexpensive investment. Invest in stuff like that instead of um, taking up a whole crew and running a mod. Your first, especially your first year, go and network and interact with other people and learn and um and chris already knows this of course but for those who don't in our region in new jersey if there's an event up in north jersey you're going to meet the people that come from like all the way down from south jersey where we live to up past new york and like connecticut so you're going to get like a local mix that may actually still come to your game even if you're on an extreme end so uh you know in south jersey we get people who come from New York and Connecticut and that, and that region who do come to games every month. So that's not totally unusual, which puts streamation and other double exposure events in a really good um, place, a good location to kind of draw that crowd. So you'll expand your reach a bit, um, but I don't think it's worth having a whole thing. And I really admire the games that do it, especially, you know, the, uh, the, the buffer games that, do such a big setup, you know, because they so do so much work to do it, it right. So it's much so work. much work. It really is. I, I really, I respect how much work it is because I used to be staff at a game and I used to help set up all that stuff, and it's so much work. And I can't imagine doing that for four, just for a four-hour thing. Honestly, it's just wow. Um, now, if you're running a one-shot game, that's something I would really look forward to maybe doing in the future. Um, Max is great at running games. You know, maybe in the future we could actually run something and I could, like, be an NPC in that. Um, I would rather do something like that and um, and work on it that way. I think the people running the Game of Thrones LARP really have it right. They have uh, minimal props. They're super organized with the characters, with getting people set up and going. They use the Kronos system, which is really easy to learn. I'm so bad at numbers. I can't freaking, like, add and subtract. I have a hard time you know, with Buffer Combat, because I'm so bad at numbers, they make everything really easy. They're very accessible throughout the whole game, and they just attract a really high level of role player. So I think they that type of game um, is best suited for the convention, and the fact that they only run it, like, at the convention makes it even better. It's like, that's the game that makes me absolutely 100% want to go to the next event they do, 
even if I don't know anybody else there. I will go just for that game. So uh, that's the type of game I think that's best suited for it that will get players continually. Um, one shots and like make sure if you're running a one shot, make sure people know who you are. And if you are affiliated with another game and you want them to know, tell them like two or three times as you're running it. So like again, my name is such and such. Here's my card. Like pass other you know your info because um, like I, I mentioned Lizzie Stark who ran who wrote and ran in residency. She's amazing. Uh, I know from playing one of her games last year that as soon as uh, Sarah mentioned to me, like, oh, you know, there's this game in residency. As soon as I saw that it was Lizzie's, I was like, all right, well, you know, a role player that I respect is recommending it to me. And, you know, one who ran a great game last year is uh, is in charge of it. That's all I need. So uh, basically, like, next year, like, even if it's not something I'm interested in, I'll still probably, like, play it just because she's running it. So, uh, yeah, you can build a good reputation there, but not the best for uh, for a regular buffer combat game, I don't think. Not a great investment of your time. Definitely uh, ask yourself, uh, what is it that you're trying to do uh, if you're just trying to get players? Uh, and ask yourself, what kind of game are you trying to run? Uh, especially in New Jersey, and especially in North Jersey, there's a lot of saturation. So if you are trying to pitch a game that's similar but better writing try to market that aspect of it hey this is something you already know but our world's so much cooler or we have a higher level of role playing or costuming or this is innovative and different but i think that your best results are going to be through getting a group of six or seven costumed charismatic individuals in one or two hotel rooms and throwing a party. That's true. Like, you don't have to do the ballroom. You don't have to run it. And just kind of like, hey, come hang out with us and meet us. You know, eat some of our food, drink some of our booze. And it could be in character or out of character. It, do it doesn't have to be. You know what I mean? Uh, just kind of like get them to know you. Because it's been my limited experience that people like to play with people they get along with and feel comfortable with. So if you run this That's icebreaker so party... Nobody else is doing that anymore. So it, it can be kind of risky, you know, with drinking and underage. And, but as long as you get that all worked out, it doesn't even have to have any alcohol. But if you get that all worked out and you have a cool atmosphere, some music, and people have fun hanging out with you, they're going to they're gonna want to find out, get to know more about who you are and what you can do. And if you can throw a good party, you can run a good game. Yeah. And uh, to build on that, um... You know, like there were some people there who were wearing their uh, home game or the game that they run. They were wearing like their gear and that's all they really had to do to network. Uh, you know, I saw, of course, like Isabel was wearing a 17 of IGE shirt um, and I saw Ben and Mari were wearing their New World Magiscola jackets, right? I had never met them in person, but I recognized them across the lobby because they were wearing their brand, you know, and they still had seats left for uh, for some of their games or one or more of their games while they were there, but they weren't really there selling. They were there participating and networking and interacting, and they really do a great job of understanding what it means to build a relationship in the community and earn that trust so that when they do share something or ask for support, like the community's there. And, um, you know, they were really, really genuine about that. So. Uh, definitely like represent your brand, wear the gear. I was terrible about that because I was in costume the whole time. I didn't wear a Geek Initiative shirt. Um, I didn't wear a Seventh Kingdom shirt. I was in costume. I was wearing some Marvel stuff too because I'm obsessed with the war. Everyone knows that. Uh, but yeah, so you can still get a lot done at conventions even if you're um, not running anything. So don't feel like you have to run something to network and meet the right people. So, um, let's see. Lee asks, what's the weirdest, most hilarious thing you saw last weekend? I'm going to say, especially now that Lizzie is here, <laughs> I'm going to say that um, some of the scenarios that evolved in the aforementioned in residency were just fantastic. Uh, we had one segment of each day that we played out in the LARP, um, during which our characters were drinking, and just so many funny thing hap things happened. And there were such simple game mechanics, 
but there were just a few things that worked so well to set the stage for really serious things or really humorous things. And one of them was there was a, a section of the room that represented a pool house. And um, and uh, if you were sitting in the pool, like just in your regular clothes, then that represented you being in your bathing suit. And if you were under the, the tarp or the sheet that represented the pool, then um, <laughs> then uh, you were you were skinny dipping. And if there were more than three people in the pool, then majority rules and everyone else who came in had to do what the majority was doing. And it was just, it struck me as really weird at first, but then by the time we got to the last night, of course, it was like all of these artists, everyone had the sheet pulled up. We were all, you know, drinking water. Yes, uh, 11 people drank nearly all of the water tanks, she's saying. Yeah, we, we did have to take a lot of pee breaks. I felt very hydrated. I felt drunk after the LARP ended. Um, but just like it's it, it's like when you have a tight knit LARP community or a theater community, you get real comfortable with each other. And by the end of the experience, you're just like just partying. Um, one character was drinking a lot and he came in and barfed in the pool. <laughs> Someone else was in it. Well, a couple of us read it, and we we scampered out of the pool, and then another character, actually my friend Brian's character, runs in and like dives in the pool. <laughs> and we're all like, "Oh my gosh!" And his character was named Donatello, which is hilarious because artist slash Ninja Turtle. Um, but he dives in the pool, and everyone's like, "Ninja Turtle, what are you doing? Someone just barfed in the pool." <laughs> And it was freaking hilarious. And just LARPing, being drunk, like, kind of made me feel drunk. Even after the LARP ended, like, I definitely had the giggles while we were debriefing. And I still felt drunk when I went up to the room. Like, I don't know. Maybe it was because I was LARPing. Maybe it was because I was dehydrated and that I drank a bunch of water. Um, but definitely a, a few of us felt that way. And um, it was just, it was really fun. So that was kind of the, the most hilarious thing. I didn't see anything weird, though. But I was LARPing. I was not at those tabletop games like Max was. He probably saw some weirder stuff. Weird? Not really. Every once in a while, I'd see somebody walk by dressed up in something suspect. Uh, suspect? But... Like, how do you mean suspect? Just, like, something you thought was strange? Like, maybe they were cosplaying something I'd never heard of, and it was a very elaborate, detailed costume. It was just crazy. Like, something that made you look two or three times. Um, the funny thing, I mean, I had a funny encounter that I played at, uh, oh. and everyone was actually role-playing it. There was one part where we had to get to point A to point B, but we had to be, like, smuggled in. So in order to do that, there was, like, these secret society that worked under the cover of, like, performers like stage performers and we were like infilt we infiltrated as like a performance troupe and then when we arrived like uh we were like had to like role play a performance so it was like everybody on the spot had to think of something their character would do and uh myself and another person was playing we were playing halflings like little hobbit people so uh, one person like suggested that I was like put like in a blueberry outfit, like I was like a little kid. So I imagined myself looking like one of those Hanes kind of characters, you know, like a Hanes like a underwear a fruit character. <laughs> but uh, everybody had like some really goofy performances, and of course someone was like, you know, juggling swords because they're like, I'm dexterous, I'm holding swords, I'll just juggle them. But uh, at one point there was a musical number, there was a dance number involved. And uh, my character I was playing had bad luck all the time. Uh, he was a jinx. And uh, so, like, at one point in the number, I kind of, like, fall and, like, my pants split. And uh, <laughs> you know, I, I purposely, like, fail it. But in a way where, like, everybody was laughing at me. So it ended up working out well. And uh, I think everybody had more fun with that than some of the combats. Uh, everyone in the group kind of had the right idea, really bought in. And uh, good improv acting. It went really well. That sounds really fun. I like to um, really, really get into it <laughs> with tabletop games. And uh, DMs like Max appreciate the role-playing style and understand what I'm going to do. But sometimes I'll like start talking in character at a tabletop game, which I would think is normal. Or like I'll play a bard and then I'll act like a bard. 
uh and people look at me like i'm weird and then i'm just like yeah i should probably just go larp now uh, you're, at the but, wrong, you're at the wrong table i am yeah that means i'm at the wrong table um but uh that means i just get more picky with who i tabletop rp with and usually i'm in one of max's games nowadays uh but yeah that's the there were other hilarious things that happened i mean during the game of thrones larp i definitely individually threatened uh just about every member of the night's watch um i was playing a <laughs> i was playing a chief a, a wildling chief and um I was like, I knew that if I like attacked any of them where others could see that I would just die, right? So I would like, I started with like the weakest looking one and I just threw them up against the wall. And like by the end of it, I individually threatened most of them. Probably not the ones that deserved to be threatened. But uh, I, they were all like, the role playing was just so good. It was funny because of how surprised they were that I was just like throwing them against the wall. And I always noticed since I'm used to playing these buffer campaign larps i'm used to being aggressive and not the most aggressive person there but when i play freeform larps or rp only larps i notice i am consistently the most aggressive person there and it's not even always intentional it's just you know i'm just so so used to a more aggressive setting i suppose and uh in this particular setting um i definitely was uh that was that was pretty interesting and uh and resulted in some hilarity but i think most of the humorous situations were actually that i experienced in game were actually in, in residency which uh, i didn't expect i was a little worried because when we developed our characters it was all about like exploring these traumas that they'd, ex that they'd experienced at a young age and i was like oh okay well maybe this is gonna get really dark and there were there were like some real deep moments you know the characters are drinking and you're meditating on your work during the day but um it ended up being more hilarious than anything. And my character actually, she had a kind of sad time towards the end of it because she was in this like unrequited thing with her BFF. And um, God, what does that say about myself that all of my characters had that situation? Uh, but basically, you know, like um, she was she was having a sad time, but it was more about the group and um, what they experienced together. And she didn't walk out of it, like, just losing her best friend. She she got, like, a mentor. Um, you know, she was definitely keep in touch with the other friends she made there. So that was pretty fun. So, yeah. Hilarious and, and also really feelsy. <laughs> so, oh, so, okay, uh, so we've had a couple people drop in. They're pitching yeah. a couple things. Lizzie was letting us know about her Gen Con plans and... Uh, how she's going to release a PDF, Lizzie. You got to come on and hang out with us next week and uh, tell us about you it. You should be. Yeah. You should be. Um, be a guest. Yeah, Lizzie, you should definitely come on and be a guest. And uh, great, that sounds awesome. I will set that up and uh, and be in touch with you. Uh, we Thanks, talked Siri, a lot about. Come on yeah, as well. absolutely. She was uh, with we the talk... Game of Thrones. She let we us talk know all that the they're... time about our buffer larps, and um, always hope that somebody will drop in and talk about free forum and Nordic larping. Uh, so that would be cool. Um, and yeah, Matt talked to me earlier too because he wants to talk about uh, a very specific topic: uh, role playing uh, the Fey folk, which he and I have both done. So uh, we will also cover that in a future um, a, a future LARP chat live. Uh, so yeah, surprise. Lizzie will be on next week. <laughs> we'll talk about hashtag feminism. We will talk about in residency, our dream nation experiences, and we will talk about Nordic LARPing and freeform. Um, actually, last year at Dream Nation was my first freeform LARP experience, and it was one of Lizzie's games. And it was so exciting because I was able to take a piece of it with permission of the participants. We had developed a ritual in the game. And I was able to take a piece of that, one of the rituals we developed, and I actually brought it into Seventh Kingdom on my regular Baffer LARP and um, ran it as a ritual. Yes, I will <laughs> come to the dark side. Uh, and I actually ran it as a ritual of Kruak, the god of cruelty, in game. And people were very moved by that ritual and had asked me afterwards, where did you ever come up with the idea for that? And I was like, Oh, it was part of this freeform LARP at Dreamation, and we like totally made it up. And I was like, 
this really fits our culture, you know, in this game. And I asked them if I could take it with me and I did, and I ran it and it was really fun. Uh, so yeah. And Matt wants to know if there are links or web pages, um, Lizzie, Siri, go ahead and throw your links into the chat box there. Um, I already threw out the double exposure uh, link before. I'm going to grab uh, Oblivion LARP's link here. There's Oblivion. And I will grab Faglen, which I also played over the weekend, as did Max. There we go. Um, yeah, so uh, those are the games I played over the weekend. Um, hashtag feminism, I already mentioned as well, was excellent. And uh, I definitely recommend Dreamation. I feel like I had a lot better time this year because I knew what was going on. And every time I walked into a room, I knew at least one person. That really helped me feel very comfortable just stepping into a game and LARPing. I also want to give a shout out to the experienced players in the campaign LARPs who uh, really kind of helped mentor and like interact with people. Those are always really great people to encounter in regular games, especially when there's a really like heavy, long rule book. I've been to Faglen a couple of times. I'm not gonna lie. Like I know the stuff my character does, but I had to like rebuild my character. I don't know all the rules, right? Whatever. Uh, but there were always people there to help me out. And um, I, as far as Oblivion goes, I'd only been to their module at Dreamation last year. So, same thing. There were like always people to help out, um, and that was uh, really awesome too. So when you go to a, a game, uh, especially these campaign games that are running at Dreamation, and you see people like that in the game, it makes you want to go. It makes you feel comfortable. So thank you to everybody that made me feel comfortable and um, and helped me to have a really good time there. I'm going to pop one more link in here. Two more links. I lied. So Seventh Kingdom is my regular uh, game that I go to. And then, um, of course, LARP Chat Live is sponsored by the Geek Initiative, which is at geekinitiative.com. And uh, we have been publishing a lot of articles recently, uh, role-playing games, LARPs, video game reviews, you name it. And uh, if you have anything you'd like to contribute, it does not have to be centered on women in geek culture. It just has to be friendly towards us. So uh, any kind of comic book review, stuff like that, we love it. We'll take it. Uh, we had Kate went and uh, checked out the pop culture exhibit at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So that'll be coming out soon, uh, hopefully tonight, maybe tomorrow. And uh, that's that's all I got. So stop by geekinitiative.com. And you can also follow us at roll for geekinit on Twitter. Max, do you have anything else to add? I know there's some MR events coming up. Uh, yeah, Mystic Rumps is a South Jersey-based uh, theater troupe, interactive theater troupe. We run a lot of live-action events over across many genres. Uh, Empire of Cheers is uh, in the middle of March, and you can find out about it on our Facebook, of course. And I would say that it has the most passionate following of players. It only runs three, maybe four times a year, and the role-playing and costuming are top-notch. And we're super pumped for it to have an event coming up. Uh, and then our central game, our, our highest production value game, is not this weekend, but next game, uh, weekend. And uh, it's proving thing, it's looking to be a great event. If you have any questions, if you want to come check us out, uh, we would love to have you. We can have you on at Blab. I'll Skype anybody. Uh, we can talk on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, let you know what's going on and answer any questions you got. Also, you can connect with me uh, on Facebook if you're not already connected with me there. And um, I always do the Facebook invites for the blab. It seems to be the easiest way, the, the way to get the most amount of people. So I go ahead and set that up. And <laughs> yes, follow, follow Max if you want those memes. Um, I always set those up and like spam. No, not spam. I publish them a couple of times on my feed so you won't miss them. Uh, and yeah. Every Tuesday, 7.30 Eastern, and Lizzie Stark will be our guest next week. So we'll actually talk about LARPing that isn't necessarily bad for combat LARPing in South Jersey. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go ahead and sign off. This recording will be available. I'll go ahead and post the link to it in the uh, Facebook group with the original invite, or you can shoot me a message. We will see you next week. This is Tara. And also, Max, if you want to give a sign-off. 
Good night, guys. Right. From the Geek Initiative, and we will chat with you next week. Bye.